So uh, this is the Graduate Studies in European Literature class, and uh, this uh, semester we'll be studying the works of Dante, in particular the Divine Comedy. We'll talk a little bit about his so-called minor works, but the focus is on the Divine Comedy. It's a long work. We won't be able to read all of the Divine Comedy, but we'll read the Inferno, first volume, and as much as we can, Selections from Purgatorio and Paradiso. As I say here, the fo focus of the class is, is a kind of a dual focus. On the one hand, we look at the Divine Comedy as a, as a work of literature, as a work of art, we analyze the uh, various formal elements and thematic elements of the work independently. But also, I want to talk about it as a fundamental text for an understanding of Western attitudes and values. So even if you're, you know, mainly interested in 20th century American literature, I think you're still going to find the material of this class useful because what Dante talks about are uh, attitudes and values which are still at the foundation of discussions of values in the Western world today. So obviously, you know, one of the things that all of your uh, at least especially your foreign professors are trying to do is to reduce the uh, gap between Western and uh, Eastern understandings of the world and I think by studying a work like the Divine Comedy you can find out a lot more about what makes Westerners do the really strange things they do uh, in the same way that uh, when I read Hong Lo Meng or Shi O Ji I get a better understanding of what you know, what makes uh, Chinese civilization unique and interesting. So the required text is the translation by An Alan Mandelbaum, which is really, really a good translation. When I first started teaching the Divine Comedy a long time ago, back in Canada, uh, I used John Charty's translation. And uh, then uh, when I taught a, a graduate version of the class, I used the, the Charles Singleton, which is a prose translation, very scholarly translation. And when I came to, uh, to University of Macau, I started using Mandelbaum. And, you know, I would find things, and you'll, as we're going through the text, I'll be pointing out things that I think, you know, maybe he could have done better. But uh, this last uh, previous year, I've been working with one of the graduate students going through the text in Italian. And again and again, I'm amazed by how beautifully he's able to translate this poem. You know, we're laboring over it, saying, oh, what could this be? Oh, it must be something like that. It's so complicated. We look over at his translation. Not only is it, you know, perfectly accurate, every word has an equivalent, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful English, too. So this is really one of the great translations. So, uh, it's called Commonplaces of Medieval European uh, Thought. And a commonplace is an idea or attitude that's widely shared. It's accepted almost without thinking by the majority of members of the society. So, a good example in our own society is the idea that increasing GDP is equivalent to increasing social well-being. Now, I just was reading the net the other day, there's been a study of happiness in different societies, different uh, contemporary societies, and uh, very interestingly, GDP doesn't have a good correlation to happiness. The least happy people, surprisingly, are Europeans, and one of the least happy peoples are the Italians. And I was just in Italy uh, over the spring break, and I thought to myself, gee, the people are so sullen here in the shops, or like this. And I was thinking, I'm, I'll be glad to get back to China, where I go in and I get, Huan Ying, Huan Ying, you know, and how can I help you? And, and uh, you know, when we first came to China in 1984, it was just the opposite. The people in the shop were really grim, and they would hardly help you. You had to take your money and wave it at them, please, can I buy this book, you know? Well, maybe, I guess I'll take your money, you know. So everything has changed now. In any case, uh, there's no, no correspondence between economic activity and people being happy in a society. 
But we tend to think of that, you know, oh well, the, in, the GDP is increasing, that's great, everybody's going to be much better off. Not necessarily, right? But it's a commonplace, something we accept. It may not be true, but it's something that everybody sort of has as an assumption. And there are the topics of the lecture. So I'm going to talk about this, an age of faith. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one aspect of this, and I'm going to talk about this. So the medieval period is often called an age of faith, the most central of all medieval commonplaces, and the one that's most difficult for us to understand, because what faith is, is what you do not see. Right? This is uh, St. Augustine's famous definition, what then is faith? If not to believe in that which you do not see. So that is totally in conflict with what we feel today, that truth is what you find through observation and experiment. A.J. Ayers was a kind of controversial, very um, uh, influential philosopher uh, back in the uh, mid-20th century, and he went so far as to say that the only statements that have any meaning at all are statements which can be verified through observation and experiment. So he said metaphysics, the whole branch of philosophy that's called metaphysics, is simply a non-subject. There's nothing there to talk about because metaphysical speculation is speculation about things that cannot be proved through experiment and observation. Therefore, there's no truth value to statements in metaphysics. So how did the medieval people believe they could have knowledge of a world that was supernatural, that was beyond the world of the visible? Well, there were two sources to this kind of knowledge. First, they felt that physical, the physical world itself contained symbols or signs of an underlying spiritual world. And they called this the book of nature. You know, just like we read a book and expect to find... Uh, symbolic meaning and implications in it. So they looked at actual events and phenomena of the world and they interpreted them symbolically in the way we interpret events and situations in a book. So at the end of the Divine Comedy, Dante has several beautiful metaphors for what he sees when he sees God. And he says one of the ways he describes what he saw is to say he saw the pages of all the universe, bound by love, into one volume. So I think that's really a neat way of looking at uh, the world. You know, all of these things you see are like pages. But what he saw was how all of this fits together into one book, one volume. And the binding, what holds the book together, all those pages together, is this universal force we'll talk about just in a moment, uh, which is love a kind of universal field theory for the Middle Ages. The most important way of finding out about the spiritual world was by means of revelation. That is, to discover, reveal spiritual truths directly to human beings. And of course, the most important source of that revelation was the Bible itself, this sacred text. So here is a, a kind of an illustration of the importance of the Bible as a means of understanding the spiritual substratum of existence. Here is a, this is Giotto, who was a contemporary of Dante, who knew Dante. And uh, this is his painting of St. John, one of the four writers of the Gospels, the stories of Christ's life that appear in the New Testament. So you see him there, and he's got his book, and he's got his pen, and he's writing, and he looks kind of meditative. But I've left out an important part of the painting, the top part, because the top part is an angel. And the clear implication is the angel is telling him what to write, that he is simply taking dictation. He is simply like a secretary, writing down the words that are coming directly from the world of the spirit. So that's what the whole painting looks like. Here's a one that's even more explicit. This is uh, St. John again. This is a 12th century manuscript uh, illumination, and you see him sitting there in his chair. He's got his 
gospel here. He's dipping his pen in the ink. But here's a hand coming out of the top of the uh, illustration holding a dove which seems to be pecking something from his ear. But actually the dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, one part of the Christian Trinity, one part of the Christian Godhead that is responsible for inspiration. And the dove is telling him what to write. And again, the idea is that the Bible tells us about a spiritual world that we can't directly experience. Here's another one, the same idea, with the dove there just sort of pointing at the head of, this is, uh, I guess we don't know which one this is. This is An evangelist means a writer of one of the Gospels, one of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Here's one uh, from the 16th century, it's becoming sort of more realistic, and you see, uh, there's, this is St. John again, and you see this old guy up here with a crown, and there's sort of like a laser beam coming down. But that again makes the same point that he's being inspired in his writing by God. And then this one I just put into, because I thought it was so a nice uh, sequence. Here is uh, Rembrandt, the middle of the 17th century. It's becoming very realistic now. And the angel is turned into a young man who doesn't look really necessarily supernatural at all. And he's whispering in... Uh, Matthew, this is Matthew this time, one of the other gospel writers, whispering in his ear as he writes the gospel. So for people of the Middle Ages, in a, the important world, the one that gave everyday events meaning and significance, importance, was the world revealed by faith, a supernatural, invisible world. The spire of Salisbury Cathedral, built in the 14th century, time of Chaucer, 123 meters high, very high tower. The late uh, medieval Gothic uh, churches, cathedrals in England and in uh, France, there was a kind of, it was like civic pride. It's sort of like, you know, today, who can have the highest skyscraper? You know, it was uh, um, someplace in Indonesia, they had that huge thing. And now, there's a, in, in one of the Middle Eastern, Kuwait or someplace, they're building one that's even higher. And so it's sort of like this, you know, who could have the, the cathedral with the highest uh, spire? And so this was incredible. I mean, this is still very impressive today, the height of that spire. And you have to, of course, recognize that in the Middle Ages, most people were used to seeing one-story one buildings, like the huts in their village. They go to a pilgr take a pilgrimage to Salisbury, and they see this cathedral, I mean, it would be just overwhelmingly uh, different than any kind of architecture they'd ever seen before. So the question is, you know, they had built this spire, and almost immediately the actual foundations of the church hadn't been constructed in a way to be able to hold such a heavy spire, and almost immediately the spire began to shift. Now everybody has heard of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, which is, wow, it's really leaning. This was not, this just a few degrees. You can, you, if you very carefully look at it, you can see it a little bit. It's just, I think, a degree and a half or two degrees. It's not very much. But they, they could tell, you know, this was, this was scary. This might collapse. And so what did they do to safeguard their tower? They put a piece of the robe of the Virgin Mary at the very top of the tower. So I think that's a good example of, you know, how would, we, how would we fix that tower? Well, how did they fix the Tower of Pisa? They dug under, they pumped cement under there, they, you know, we, it was an engineering repair. But they didn't think, first of all, of making an engineering repair. They did later, they put in some bracing. The first thing they thought of is a spiritual repair, right? After all, this is the Church of Mary. In Salisbury, it's dedicated to her, and so who better to protect this church than the Virgin Mary herself? And uh, if you study Chaucer, you know about relics. I mean, a relic is a piece of the body or of the clothing of a saint or a holy person like the Virgin Mary or Christ himself that has special uh, spiritual power. And so they put this relic of the uh, robe at the top of the tower, and that was their way of making sure that it didn't collapse. 
there is a picture of Salisbury Cathedral. It's a beautiful, beautiful church. And it's, uh, it's, it's nicer than a lot of the medieval cathedrals because it's not right downtown. Uh, the, Cal- the Salisbury Cathedral has a big, uh, they call it the Cathedral Close. It's like the Cathedral Garden. Uh, a big expanse of grass around it. And Salisbury itself is a part of, a, a part of England that's very flat. And so this cathedral just uh, jumps out of the ground. There's the, uh, the nave, very high. These pillars, if you get down here and look up, you can see they're slightly curved uh, because of the weight, because of the weight of that spire. And there's uh, from a children's book that I bought when we were there. That's a sort of artist's uh, imagination of put, putting the uh, relic in the capstone of the tower. You can see there are two kind of like the two masons that look very confident, and then, and then the priest looks scared to death. Right? There's a priest up there supervising this, but he obviously is not as uh, confident being at that height as the, as the workmen are. This is important too, order of time. I like this. History is a book which God has written and which we are slowly reading. Think about that as a way of looking at history. You know, no wonder they saw historical events having meaning. God has written history. And, you know, he knows the whole plot. And we're reading it page by page slowly as we live our lives. This is what we have to talk about, because this is sometimes a cause of real uh, misunderstandings with Chinese students. What is sin? Well, sin is an offense against God. A violation of divine law. It's different from a crime. A crime is an offense against the human community. A violation of human law, right? So the the idea of sin, at least as far as I've been able to find, there's no real equivalent. Sway means crime, and yet, I guess it's a little closer to the idea of sin, but basically have the meaning of crime. So... To make a distinction, murder is a crime, it's an offense against human law, and it's a sin, an offense against God's law. But suicide is a sin, according to the Middle Ages, because your body is not your own, it's God's. Uh, But it's not a crime, not in most uh, jurisdictions, and gluttony is not a crime. Lying, unless you're under oath, is not a crime. Adultery, blasphemy, of course, if you're living in a theocracy, then these things become crimes as well. Sins become crimes. But in most uh, societies, there's a distinction between uh, sin and crime. So, everyone sins. Maybe not so much with the graduate students, but with the undergraduates. First few years I was teaching, especially up here, I think Macau, because of, you know, strong Portuguese, a lot of people are Catholic in Macau, there's a little better understanding, but uh, when I got to Beijing and was teaching this, the undergraduates would say, so, you know, you, you sin and straight to the inferno. And I said, no, no, that's not true. You know, those people, and, and they thought, you want to get to heaven, you've got to be perfect. No, it's impossible, right? Everybody, according to medieval theology, everybody sins. The only sinless person that ever lived was Christ himself, or, and maybe his mother, right? So the Bible says, this is the Old Testament, the good man sins seven times daily. And the Gospel of John, if we deny that we have sinned, we are deceived, and there's no truth in us. So everybody sins. The thing is that under the new law, according to the teachings of Christ, forgiveness of sin is possible. And in the Middle Ages there was a method by which you could be forgiven your sin. And we'll talk about this more during the course of the semester because it's important for Dante. There are three steps. You have to be sorry, contrition. You have to admit your sin, confession. And you have to try to make up for what you've done wrong. For example, if you've stolen something, you have to give it back. So, by a ruling of the Fourth Lateran Council, an important church meeting in 1215, Everyone had to perform penance at least once a year, had to go through this procedure of contrition, confession, and satisfaction. 
And one of the ways of making satisfaction, for example, if you had offended God in some way, there was no way you could kind of pay him back, you had to do something that would show your faith. One of the ways of showing your faith was by going on a pilgrimage. And, of course, that's the basis of the Canterbury Tales, the pilgrimage. Also, Dante's journey in the Divine Comedy can be seen as a kind of pilgrimage. Sometimes you'll hear me talking about the character in the Divine Comedy as Dante Pilgrim. Sometimes I'll say Dante Narrator, right? Uh, Dante Persona. You could even use that, although I don't think I ever do. But you'll see these different ways of differentiating the fictional character of the poem and Dante, who actually wrote the poem, right? They're not the same. They have the same name, but they're not the same person. So Dante's journey through hell can be seen as a recognition of sin, his ascent of the mountain of purgatory, a kind of satisfaction for sin, and then, of course, the, the final section, the uh, paradiso, is his reward. That is, the, you could almost see it as the absolution of sin. So medieval Christians did not believe that sin necessarily means damnation. A person ends up in hell only if he or she refuses to feel regret, refuses to admit that he or she has made a mistake, and refuses to make what compensation is possible. Damnation results only from obstinate, stubborn refusal to admit and feel sorry for one's serious mistakes. So I don't know if that will make it easier for you when you're reading the Inferno or not. But I have a lot less sympathy for someone who does something stupid and then refuses to admit that he ever did anything wrong, right? That's the kind of person that you'll find in the Inferno. And what you'll find them doing, of course, is still refusing to admit that they'd ever done anything wrong. They're just stuck in what we call today denial, right? They're stuck in denial of any responsibility for what they've done. Now, a famous example of that is this beautiful uh, woman, Francesca, who's had a love affair with a man by the name of Paolo, and you find her talking about her love affair to Dante, and she's got all the excuses in the world for why she did this, and none of them are her fault. They're someone else's fault. One of her arguments is it's the book's fault that they were reading when they made love. So here's an illustration just to kind of, uh, I found this last summer when I was, I'm doing some work on the depiction of the souls in uh, the Inferno. And uh, so this is the last judgment of 50, late 15th century, just to sort of fix this in your mind. There is Christ in majesty, and you see he's, uh, he's uh, got one hand up, that's the good side, the right hand side, that's the side of the saint. The other one's pointing down, that's the side... Uh, of those who uh, refuse to uh, repent their sins. And so you see, here's a very nice looking angel. They're all naked, of course. That's what I'm interested in. One of the undergraduates asked this question in a journal. She said, is Virgil naked? And I thought, yeah, is he naked? I can't imagine him being naked. And she said she couldn't imagine, you know, Dante. We know Dante is wearing his Florentine robe because it's mentioned several times in the course of the descriptions. And she said, I just cannot accept the image of Dante standing there fully clothed, and next to him there's Virgil naked. And I said to myself, I can't accept that either. But on the other hand, you don't take your clothes with you when you go to the afterlife, right? I mean, you're, it's like when you're born, you're not born with clothes on, right? And I thought, what an interesting idea. And so then I started looking at all of these illustrations to try to see. I haven't found one in which Virgil is naked. But I found one in which um, Statius, who's a character that Dante and Virgil meet as they're climbing the mountain of Purgatory, I found one in which he is naked. And so there they are standing, talking. Statius is a famous poet, too, Roman poet. And there they are standing and talking, and there's Virgil, you know, completely clothed in a toga. There's Dante with his Florentine robe. And there's Statius, you know, (laughs) absolutely naked. And it's just very disquieting to see. And the, and the angel is, you know, they're looking quite happy. They're going in, you know, I guess, I don't know who this is. This is probably St. Peter. Yeah, it must be St. Peter. So they're going into heaven. Here. This is, represents heaven. And here the devil is just kind of shoveling these people into this ghastly 
That's hell's mouth. It's a, the idea that hell is Leviathan in the Old Testament. So it's like a huge fish or a huge monster. And that's, uh, that's uh, going off to hell. So the point is, remember, you don't go to hell just because you've sinned. You've got to, oh, and the importance of forgiveness. This is the most important thing. I forgot this. This is my favorite passage from the Bible. Then Peter, this is one of Christ's disciples, came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? This is like Confucius and one of his disciples. You know, they're asking him questions and he gives the answer. So you think seven times, you know, like, okay, I forgive you. Okay, I forgive you. Seven times? None of us would do that. But what's the answer? I say not seven times, but 70 times seven times. 70 times seven times. So that's important. It's possible to be forgiven. Even Judas, who betrayed Christ himself, the medieval theologian said, could have been forgiven if he had been sorry for what he did. Right? But he didn't. He hanged himself. Which is, from the medieval point of view, the uh, indication of the fact that he thought his sin was so serious that he could not be forgiven. So he did not ask for forgiveness. The sin of despair. We'll talk about that. Dante himself, the pilgrim, is close to the sin of despair in the first canto of the Inferno. When he's trying to climb that mountain and he's forced back and he says, I almost gave up hope. That's the worst situation you can be in as a Christian. Good stuff here. Nice uh, diagram of the uh, great chain of being. When I was very early on, I think I've been teaching only about four or five years, the college I was teaching in had a public lecture series, and we got to actually go over to the, in those days, graphic design department of the university and have them do our what we do now as PowerPoints. And this guy drafted out this beautiful uh, scheme of the uh, hierarchy of creation. So that's a diagram you can look at for at least a few minutes and get quite a lot out of. The last point I wanted to talk about was the idea of love. Modern physicists are seeking what they call a unified field theory. I was reading about this uh, the other day. Uh, you know, they've got uh, pretty much Maxwell's field equations and so forth. They've got pretty much a good theory of the molecule and the atom, chemical interactions, and atomic physics. And then, of course, there's gravity, which Einstein's general theory of relativity explains pretty well, but there's no theory that can bring those two together. They're like separate universes. And what they want is a theory that will be able to explain everything, gravity and atomic and molecular forces. Well, medieval philosophers thought they had a unified field theory, something that explained everything that happened, not only in the physical world, but also the world of the spirit. Aristotle, uh, who of course was the most important philosopher for people in the Middle Ages, we'll find that out when Dante uh, sees Aristotle. You know, one of the great things about uh, going through the afterlife is you get to meet all these people, and he actually meets Aristotle, and he doesn't talk to him, but he sees him. And Aristotle is the master of those who know. That's what he calls him. Now, of course, for modern philosoph philosophers, they'd say, no, 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 Plato, Plato. But uh, Dante didn't know Plato that well. There's only one dialogue that was available to uh, people uh, of the 14th century. Aristotle was very well known and very influential. And so Aristotle had taught... Every being or thing in the universe has a natural desire, what he called an appetite, an inclination for its own good, for its own perfection. So all things move towards whatever it is that's good for them. And in medieval theology, this appetite is called love. Aquinas, who was the great uh, transmitter of Aristotelian philosophy to the Middle Ages, in his Summa Theologica, says, love is the principle of movement tending towards a beloved end. Principium motus tendentis infinum amatum. For those of you, I know some of you are studying Latin, so I put a little Latin in there for you. 
So love, it was thought, was the cause of everything that happens in both the material and spiritual world. It's a little bit like the yin-yang concept in traditional Chinese philosophy. It's a very, very broad, uh, broadly applicable idea. So how this love is expressed varies depending on the nature of the living being or the material thing that experiences it. In the first canto of Paradiso, Beatrice, who is Dante's beloved lady and also his teacher, tells uh, Dante the pilgrim that all creatures in the universe are guided, she has a different metaphor, to different ports on the mighty sea of being by love. So the metaphor there is of an ocean. And each creature in the world is going to a different port, considering uh, what its highest good uh, would be. So material things, and I won't drop this chalk because it always breaks, drop this piece of paper, material things go down because their natural place is at the center of the earth. That's how people in the Middle Ages explained the force of gravity. So a heavy object like a stone moves towards its natural place at the center of the earth. And then usually at this point I have a Bic lighter. I'm not a smoker, so I have to remember to bring it, and I didn't remember to bring it today. And I light the lighter, and of course the flame jumps up. And the explanation for that is that in the Ptolemaic system that people in the Middle Ages uh, thought was the situation of the universe, there is a sphere of fire just beyond the atmosphere. And it's that kind of fire that uh, you get with a really good gas flame. I don't know if you've ever had uh, plum pudding. It's a kind of traditional Christmas dish. And the way you make plum pudding, you make the pudding, which is like a very heavy cake, and then you pour rum on it, and then you light the rum. But when you light the rum, you do not see a flame. And if you don't think it's burning, you don't want to put your hand near there, because you will discover it is burning. It burns with such a clear flame that you can't see it. It's very, you know, rum is a very high proof alcohol, so it doesn't make a yellow flame. So in any case, that was what uh, people in the Middle Ages thought the sphere of fire was like. It was so uh, perfect a fire that uh, you really couldn't, uh, couldn't see it. So the flame wants to go to its natural place in the universe, which is the sphere of fire, and that explains why the flame jumps up. Plants have a love of natural place, and also a love of nourishing. So, uh, you know, that some plants like sun, and some don't. We even say that, right? I don't know if you say that in Chinese or not, but in English it's common for gardeners to say, this plant likes sun, and this one doesn't like sun. Well, I mean, the plant doesn't like anything it doesn't like, right? It simply either grows or it dies. But in any case, they have a certain place where they'll grow well. Here's Dante's explanation in his convivio, an early encyclopedic work that he wrote. Some keep to the water's edge, some prefer the tops of mountains, others the fields, still others lower hills. If they are transplanted, they either die or grow sad, just as though they've been separated from a friend. They also have certain requirements of nourishment. Some plants need, you know, a lot of water, acidic soil, basic soil, not so much water. Cactuses re re require practically no water, and so forth. Animals have a love of natural place. Think of the cats on the Veda campus, they're always, in the winter, they're always clustering around those heat vents on the buildings. Why? Cats are tropical animals, you know, they really shouldn't be living in Beijing at all. They're not really prepared to survive the Beijing winter. They have a love of nourishment. You know, you give a cat a piece of fish, go nuts. You give her some old rice, well, she might eat it, but probably sniff at it for a while first. And, of course, there is sexual love. Animals have that specific love. So you can see it's not as though, you know, plants lose their love of place and have a love of nourishment. It's like a pyramid. It's building up. These higher orders, higher types of creature, have all of the loves the lower types have, plus a, a, an additional, unique kind of love. Now, human beings have love of natural place. Dante thought it was perfectly reasonable 
that a person would be most happy and most healthy if he lived his entire life in the place he was born. Now, you can imagine, for him, thinking that, what a tragedy it was that he was exiled from the city of Florence, right? I mean, that's where he felt he really should be living. Now, I don't know, some people, maybe you feel that way too, I don't know, but, uh, you know, he, he thought it was natural that people would be most happy if they were living where they were born. That's their natural place. We have a love of nourishment, obviously, you know, watch all the cooking shows, we have sexual love for sure. What's the unique love that a human being has that's not possessed by the lower orders of creation? We have a love of knowledge. Aristotle again, the greatest good of a human being is to know. So when Dante gets to paradise, you know, you may be thinking, what's paradise going to be like? Is it going to be, you know, good food, sports events, beautiful women? No, 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 no. It's just knowledge. His final reward, after all that long journey, is to have knowledge of God, to see God, to be able to know God. So, you know, I don't know whether you agree with this or not, but the longer I live, the more I realize that is really, for a human being, that is one of the main things, right? Now, you're all, you know, in the middle of your university careers thinking, oh, oh God, so much work, so much reading, writing. Uh. But actually, you know, it's a great joy to learn. It's a great joy to know. So, for people in the Middle Ages, what do you want to know? You want to know truth, beauty, and goodness. And for medieval thinkers, that means knowing God, because God is the highest truth, the highest beauty, and the highest goodness for people in the Middle Ages. So an important consequence for Dante, and also for Chaucer, because I use this lecture for both, a human being loves to move towards God, just like a plant loves to move towards sunlight. You know, we call that phototropism. You have that plant in your dormitory room on the windowsill, and it starts growing like that. Remember, and you have to turn it, and it grows like that. It's always trying to go towards the light. Well, a human being's natural tendency is to go to God, right? That's the tendency we're born with. Therefore, a persuasive image in medieval literature is the idea of pilgrimage. That's obviously true of the Canterbury Tales. It's also true of Dante's journey. Dante's journey can also be seen as a pilgrimage from this world through the various stages of the afterlife to heaven. So the human being longs for the good, the true, and the beautiful, but not finding perfect goodness, truth, or beauty in this world continues seeking. And this is a beautiful passage again. The convivio means banquet. In Italian it means banquet. It was a work that Dante wrote just before he began writing the Divine Comedy. And it's a, a kind of an encyclopedia of knowledge. He calls it a banquet of knowledge for people that can't read Latin, for non-scholars, because it's written in Italian. It's sort of a popular compendium of knowledge for uh, ordinary people. Uh, the form of it is a, an explanation of some poems that he had written. Inasmuch as God is the first principle of our souls, that is the Creator, and hath made them like to himself, the soul itself most chiefly longs to return to him. And like a pilgrim who is traveling on a road where he has never been before, who believes that every house which he sees from afar is the end, and finding that it is not, directs his belief to another, and so from house to house until he comes to the inn, even so our soul, so soon as it enters upon the new and never yet made journey of life, directs its eyes to the goal of its supreme good, and therefore, whatever it sees that appears to have some good in it, it thinks to be that supreme good. So it's a lovely metaphor. You know, I think of being in a car, driving, you know, on some trip somewhere. You're trying to find a motel. You know, it's late. You're tired. You're hungry. You see a light. Oh, maybe that's the motel. No, it's just a farmhouse. And then you see another light. And you just keep going, going, hoping that you'll eventually arrive, right? And because the soul's knowledge is at first imperfect through having no experience or instruction, little goods appear great to it, and therefore it begins first for them in its longing, 
And so we see little children intensely longing for an apple. It doesn't make, it doesn't take a lot to make a little kid happy, you know. Or, you know, here's a stuffed toy. Wow, bliss, you know. I've never been so happy in my life. You know, just very small little things. That's all you need. And then, further on, longing for fine clothes. Maybe that's where you are now. And then a horse. That would be a car. In our society, that would be a car. And I know a lot of you want a car, because I've heard about that in your essays. Uh, and then a horse, and then a mistress, and then wealth, but not much, and much, and enormous. This is where uh, the 1% are, you know, not wealth. Can you imagine Barack Obama is proposing that people that make more than 250,000 American dollars a year should pay a little more taxes? And people are objecting to that? $250,000 a year? What can they do with all that money? And this comes to pass because in none of these things does a person find that for which he is ever searching, but believes he will find it further on. So it's a kind of a beautiful description of the constant frustration of life. You think you've got something, you know, my new computer. Oh, so happy with this new computer. Almost immediately I had trouble with it, you know. No, that's not an adequate basis for my happiness, right? You're constantly looking for things that will make you happy, and you're constantly finding that they're not actually going to make you completely happy. You're still looking further and further down the road. Heris non hom hernis bit wilderness, forth pilgrim forth, forth be suta di Know the country, look up, thank God of all. Hold the highway and lot the ghost they laid on truth shall they deliver. It is no dread. So that's Chaucer, basically the same idea. Here is no home, here is but wilderness. Forth, pilgrim, forth, forth, beast out of your stall. Know your country, look up, thank God for everything. everything. Hold to the highway, it's a pun. Highway means the same thing as it means in modern English. The main road, but also the highway, the way that goes up. Thank God for everything. Uh, let your spirit lead you, and truth shall deliver you. It is no fear. Truth there means the truth of uh, Christian religion.